Welcome, my friends. And Uri, welcome to Girl Take the Lead. And welcome back, Kiki Kenny. <laughs> so excited to have you with us. So thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This topic is going to be, I, I, for our listeners, I read this book by Richard Schwartz and I went, and actually Kiki, you were the one that told me about the book. You said this would be great for the podcast. And so yeah. I, so we got it, we read it and, um, it totally changed the way that I saw things. It was amazing. And I knew we needed to find an expert in this. And Uri, we're so glad that we found you to help us and help our listeners learn about this. So thanks for being here. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we can start by you introducing yourself a little bit to our listeners so they know more about you. Sure. So I am a psychotherapist and I practice out of Louisville, Colorado. It's right outside of Boulder. And I graduated from Naropa University. It was a transpersonal counseling program. And I was very fortunate 20 years ago, my supervisor, one of my supervisors said, if I could have learned one model in the beginning, and he was a little bit older and had a ton of respect for him, he said it would be IFS. Mm -hmm. And so then Richard Schwartz came and did a two-day workshop a three-day workshop, an intro, and I just hit the ground running. I've been using it ever since. And that was in 2003. Mm -hmm. So graduated, been using the model ever since. I had a chance to work at Castlewood, which is an eating, dis it was an eating disorder facility. It's no longer running, um, but Dick Schwartz was a part owner and the whole staff was trained in IFS. Mm -hmm. They're therapists, dietitians, it was amazing. And uh, I've worked in several other um, treatment centers, four of which have been for eating disorders. And I wouldn't have even gotten into that if it wasn't for Castlewood. Um, mm -hmm. Dick knew I was moving to St. Louis and he asked if I'd wanted to work there. And it was a no brainer. It was a yeah. nice feeling. And then there was a, also still not around uh, Cedar Springs, Austin. Um, these folks from McCallum Place asked me to help train their staff. And so I was able to train everybody on IFS. I taught them nonviolent communication, which is another amazing model and a parenting training called collaborative problem solving. And those three together are the core of a model I've created called uh, conscious heart integration. Um, but did that, it was a lot of fun, worked with some amazing folks and eventually ended up back in Denver, um, in Colorado and Denver. And about 10 years ago, I started teaching at Naropa University. So this kind of interesting, people who want to really go deep into IFS. My counseling program, we took a whole year of Gestalt psychotherapy, which if you've read the book, I don't know if he talks about it in No Bad Parts, but certainly in Internal Family System Second Edition, the main model he used or the main intervention he used to discover parts was the empty chair dialogue. So that's the Gestalt intervention. So that's one of the reasons why I picked up IFS as quickly as I did. I had a whole year of doing empty chair work in my grad program, learned IFS, and uh, never looked back. And so it was a bit of a full circle moment when I started teaching at Naropa. And after a few years, got the opportunity to teach that class. It's an amazing class because it's so experiential. You get to really practice with the students and watch them work and guide them. I realized it was a big light bulb moment because I'd forgotten, and uh, there are other reasons why I was uh, familiar with IFS-esque types of interventions, but it hit me like a ton of bricks. A big part of it was learning Gestalt mm -hmm. psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. So taught that class for many years, and now they are letting me teach an IFS elective in the spring, and it's going to be the first time that Yay. happening. So super exciting, and a lot of the students are excited to take it, and um, yeah, so that's some of my professional career. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of nuances I could talk about, but probably not super relevant. I raised two daughters, absolutely adore them, and have an amazing partner. And uh, when I'm not working, I'm raising children. What about um, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the history behind IFS and 
um, so our listeners understand a bit more about when we say integrated family system, what that means. Absolutely. So Dick Schwartz was originally trained as a family therapist, and he's a structural family therapist. And a, a large component of that is looking at the roles of the family members. And traditionally, uh, generically, they would say the parents should be the ones in control. Uh, not authoritarian control, but they need to be the leaders, the safe, you know, caring leaders. Um, but sometimes you saw role reversal. So a lot of the interventions would be around empowering parents to step up and be responsible, more responsible, set appropriate boundaries um, in caring, kind ways. And so you can see from that how that ended up being when you watch Dick work, there's quite a bit of that because he is very clear about how parts sometimes need to unblend and step back so that self can come in. And that essentially acts as this, this parent. So he had that background. And then a big component of family therapy, especially at that time, was systems thinking. Mm. So recognizing that if there's a change in one part of the system, it's going to affect the whole system a very interconnected way of viewing the field and the whole environment. Um, so that was baked into his training. And so he was working with um, folks that struggled with bulimia and was using the empty chair dialogue with folks. And it got to the point where uh, it can get a little unwieldy. He, he noticed a part and he tried to talk to that part. So he put it in the chair. And then what happens oftentimes is there might be another voice that comes in. So now we have part number two, or maybe it's mom's voice. So let's put that in another chair and then another part and another part. So he's doing that kind of work. And I think the way he describes it is over time, being a systems thinker, he was very kind of curious and, and aware of what are the relationships mm -hmm with these parts, with each other, and he started to see a pattern. There are essentially three different types of parts, the manager, firefighter, and exile. And we can talk a little bit more about, about what those are. And so that was kind of aha number one, um, or a major aha. And then a bit later, I think it happened in this order, he realized that people were starting to describe after they unblended, and this is IFS language, enough parts, it reached a critical mass where they just shifted into like a higher self state, where they started to have more compassion, more curiosity. And then he came up with the eight C's. Um, let's see if I can remember them. Curiosity, uh, compassion, creativity, connection, clarity, uh, calmness, mm -hmm. courage, and confidence. So that started to come in, and that was mind-blowing for, for Dick because he had been taught that compassion is something that has to be learned. These are skills that have to develop over time, but here it was, hardwired, inherent, and just coming online with people who maybe didn't receive much of that. So where did it come from? So that informed his, his ideas that self is in everybody. And that wow. capacities for healing and empowerment, all of that's there, but it's different burdens and constraints that parts get into that keep that from being expressed. Mm -hmm. It's a very transpersonal model in ways because it, it believes in people's inherent wholeness and health. And if they just get the right kind of support, nature takes over. Yeah. Well, I love the the title of the book, like no bad parts. Yeah. And I, I think when you and I spoke before, I thought we had to get rid of the bad parts. <laughs> like, like we don't want that one. We, we, we want this higher self, but like, let's ignore this other, other parts of us that get ashamed and embarrassed and angry and all. But, um, I can definitely see that thinking of ourselves as just a complete person and we have all of these different parts and and the thing 
is too, right? That those parts can blend, like you say, and unblend. Maybe, maybe explain that a little bit more for the listeners so they get that. Sure. So the the idea is well, obviously, this is the one of the core concepts in IFS is that we do have multiplicity. He used to call it multiplicity of mind, and now he calls it something a bit different. I like to think of it as multiplicity of consciousness. Um, just giving it a little broader lens, um, because we seem to have parts come out of different levels of our being. So some of them are very mental, but some of them are very somatic and feel like they they come out of our physical body, kind of like that's the source. And then some are very emotional. Um, so regardless, we can have essentially multiple personality disorder with what's now called dissociative identity disorder. And his view of it is that we all have that. It's just some people, and Ross Green, the parent trainer who created collaborative problem solving, the model I mentioned earlier, he has this brilliant, brilliant uh, little quip about the DSM. The DSM is what we all have, just a whole lot worse. And that's true about everything that's in there, essentially, as far as I'm concerned. So we all have these different parts and alters. And, and the piece around the no bad parts is that if you understand the context in which those parts were created, it's really easy to have compassion for them. Mm. Um, so in that sense, there's no bad parts. Um, and the other very non-pathologizing piece around this is that you can have an appreciation that you're not just this part. You don't just get frustrated and irritated. Sometimes you have compassion. Sometimes you're very caretaking. Sometimes you're in self. Um, so just being able to have a context that we're more than just any one part just softens things significantly. So the idea around the unblending is that most people, especially when there's a history of neglect or trauma, complex PTSD, these protector parts, so there's two classes of, protect, of parts. There's the ones that protect, and then there's the ones that are protected, and those tend to be more vulnerable. Those are the exiles. Mm -hmm. And then the managers and firefighters are the protectors. And essentially, what you have is a polarization where the more pain there is, the more these protector parts might get extreme in the spirit of, of just trying to keep them safe and maybe not mm -hmm. feeling all those bad things we felt in the past. So let's say uh, we, we grew up with a parent who is incredibly shaming and critical and judgmental. So that can create the shame and the pain and maybe even sadness. And in order not to feel that, we might become very achievement focused. So we can finally gain that parent's um, approval. Mm -hmm. uh, but then what happens over time, and if, if the pain doesn't get addressed, is we just get stuck there, and we just mm -hmm. achieve, 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 and it's not sustainable. Um, so when we're working with folks, if someone comes in and they're just very blended, and that's, we use the term blended and also hijacked. Certain parts can come in and just hijack you. Um, we want to start to create a space where those protector parts start to feel understood and honored, and, and trust you as a therapist to maybe relax a little bit so that we can attend to those younger hurt parts. And then once we're able to do that and help them feel better and unburden old beliefs or heal some of the pain, these protector parts, they change by default. Mm -hmm. I, I've reached out to Dick a couple times about difficult clients. And one of the things he he's very clear about is no matter how extreme these protective parts are, no matter how bad uh, the dissociations are, and I've had clients who have full-on delusional disorders, and that was the client he had. He was speaking to me on. He said, "Get to the trauma, get to the exile, and, and just you know, of course, have the protective parts be on board with it. But once that's relieved, they settle. They almost naturally." Um, is that and, unblending then when they when they separate? Is that that's a great question. So that's that's one of the earlier steps in IFS. So mm -hmm. essentially it's got a protocol. Um, you have these different types of parts you're on the lookout for. And in the beginning, you're just trying to identify that. 
So managers are the parts that are more proactive and more um, in the foreground and kind of running the show. And they're wanting to make sure we can be in a we can be away where all that stuff doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. So they're the managers. And then the stuff that the parts that are holding the pain, those are the exiles. Yes. Brilliant terminology. We just and this is Freud. We repress. We repress the pain and then we create these defense mechanisms to, you know, and then ends up coming across somewhat neurotic. Thank you, Freud. This third kind of part that he calls firefighters, they don't kick in until the managers start to become somewhat ineffective. Oh. And or another thing happens and it's just too much and the exiles start to come to the surface. So we might be flooded with shame or it's scary again or painful. And then the firefighters will kick in naturally, automatically, and just try to put out the fire. Mm -hmm. And where the managers are worried, or they have concerns about what other people think, the more pro-social, the firefighters, they don't care. They're, uh, what is that, the video, um, Honey Badger doesn't <laughs> care enough? They're the Honey Badger, they just, they don't care. So they come in, do whatever they need to, to just put out the fire. And oftentimes it's an addiction response. So they tend to be associated with as, as addiction behaviors um, and, or I think it can be fight, flight, freeze responses, can be very fire, firefighter-esque. So they'll come in, do their thing, but they do their thing. And then usually the managers, when they come back online are like WTF. We're trying to quit smoking. We're trying to not binge and purge. We shouldn't be restricting. Uh, and then there's more shame. And so you can see how it creates a cycle yeah. where there ends up being actually more splitting, more fragmentation, more shame. And shame, just a quick aside, this is from Teal Swan, who I love, who also does parts work. And she's familiar with IFS. She talks about shame not actually being an emotion emotion. It's more of a byproduct of the personality fragmenting. Mm. So when we're experiencing shame or when we're being shamed, that is the signal that we're breaking apart and we're repressing authentic parts of who we are. So I actually really appreciate it when people are brave enough to come into the therapy space and just unveil unveil that they they have shame, that they hold shame. And if they're able to stay present with it, it's just a direct channel to the parts that got shamed. And it can be incredibly healing if they can hang in there in a self-led way. And this, that, just getting back to the unblending piece. So step one, you're identifying who's in the room and who's maybe in the basement and you're assessing <laughs> this. Then what you wanna do is make sure that the protector parts are on board with this, on board with going deep inside and touching on some uncomfortable experiences and feelings and so they call that contracting and through the contracting those parts will unblend and this is where when dick was working with the folks and he was just putting parts on chairs he unblended that was the unblending and the self was able to come in organically there and what he learned is he could intrapsychically have people use their imagination or their felt sense and, and ask parts to step back. That's kind of his classic intervention. Um, and there's other things you can do either together or, or sometimes even instead, it's enough to just honor the part. Like, of course you learn to be perfectionist in that environment that maybe felt like a lifesaver. Yeah. And as soon as they hear that, and another intervention I like for unblending is honoring what needs they were trying to meet. And that's from nonviolent communication. Mm. We call it listening in giraffe, that no matter what people are doing or saying or what a part is doing or saying, it's always saying one of two things, please or thank you. Mm. Please meet this need. Thank you for meeting this need. And when we can listen to people in that way, it's incredibly disarming and it's incredibly validating. So I like to weave in a bit of that. Um, and then I'll just tell you the two main concerns that protector parts have are A, these feelings will never go away, never go away. And B, it's too much. It's just more than we can handle. So those give us clues around what we need to contract around. And not surprisingly, on the flip side, 
the exiles tend to be concerned that this will be their only opportunity. Mm. These parts have done such a good job at repression. And now we're in front of Mr. Naropa therapist with the soft <laughs> voice and everything's starting to disarm. <laughs> Let's go. And then you get flooded. Um, so this will be our only chance. And then the other thing that exiles just abhor is being invalidated. Oh. And that's that is such a key thing. I, I I have so much more appreciation around this working with couples. Uh, one of the worst things we can do in relationship is invalidate anyone else's subjective experience, mm -hmm. and we do it all the time when we dismiss people's feelings. And and that's really the core to the exiles in my experience. It's emotional, and feelings are always valid, mm -hmm. always. Valid. Um, they may not make a lot of sense in the present, but if you can hang in there with it long enough and do work like this, it'll always make sense based on the history. And so the exiles want to be validated and they want, and they want to know essentially this won't be their only opportunity. So now with those core worries, we know what to contract around. Mm -hmm. So what Dick traditionally says with the um, protective parts is, we don't want to give these parts more power, but if we could help them feel better, would you be willing to step back and give us a try? And that, that's usually the linchpin. Um, they just want to know it's going to be better. Yeah. Um, and then what you have to let the exiles know is that this will not be your only opportunity. And I'll even have clients let the exiles know that we're scheduled for reoccurring sessions every other week. Um, that the part that the client has a meditation practice and they tune into their parts, anything to essentially give the the exile parts a secure base. Uh, th these are all a lot of the stuff baked into IFS, not surprisingly, our attachment parenting principles, uh, having close proximity, mm -hmm. expressing loyalty, um, bonding around similarities is one, uh, showing children that they matter inherently that you love them just because they're them, not because we have an achievement orientation or an image orientation or status. Um, it's unconditional acceptance and that we're committed. Yeah. We're committed to them. So, so Kiki, I, I'm just curious, and as you listen to this um, and knowing that you've done some work on it yourself, I mean, what do you see about this? You know, I think, well, so for when I was reading about parts and getting to kind of know my protector, and I've been um, working with a therapist for a couple of years who kind of introduced IFS to me as well. And I would oftentimes in sessions say, a part of me feels like this and a part of me feels like this. And, you know, he's like, you know, talk about those parts, like what part is that, you know, so kind of like subconsciously, I felt these parts coming up, but not really sure who they were or even what they looked like. I've really had a lot of joy and like personifying kind of what they look like. Cause it also says a lot to me, like my protector has, it's like a knight almost like armor on and very intense and very cold. Um, very just like stern almost. And throughout the years, my protector has really, you know, felt the need to work overdrive. And honestly, um, something freeing for me personally has, you know, in, interestingly enough, my inner child or that part of me that is fun and warm and talks to strangers and isn't afraid um, was exiled somehow in the midst of you know, my life. <laughs> and, um, you know, personally, I felt a lot of joy welcoming that kind of inner child to, to come out and have conversations without the protector trying to, you know, protect that child from not being hurt almost like not trying to have it feel shamed if it's, you know, rejected by someone or a situation. Um, and so, you know, protectors are very, um, they have, you know, every part has good, has good intentions. I'm very grateful to my protector part. Um, and I've grown very familiar with it. Um, and 
it's just really cool to explore all the different parts, but that's kind of been personally my experience with it. And I've been having a really great joy with that. Um, and do yeah. You think, do you think too, that as you've gotten older mm-hmm. and you've gone in and you're working, you know, you've got this way, quote, you're supposed to be like, I was on a, with three girlfriends last week and, and we hadn't seen each other for 50 years. So we had this way of being with each other when we were in high school. Mm -hmm. So there was this return to who I was in high school and somewhere because I became very achievement oriented, you would describe my family perfectly. (laughs) why I became so achievement oriented. Um, I felt like I had to be a certain way. You know, we, the three, the four of us were talking about, had we ever had a me too moment? And I said, you know, I haven't. Two of the other four had, and I thought about that for, well, why was that? Why hadn't I had a me too moment? I realized that my protector was like huge. There's no way that a guy was going to take advantage of me or, you know, hold power over me. It was like, no way, no way was that going to happen. And I thought it was because I felt I needed to be a certain way in business like I needed to, like you said, armor, you had an armor about it, that I wonder if sometimes in our jobs or where we're working, we feel very vulnerable because there are people in power that control, do you have a job? Do you not have a job? Are you, you know, what your, your home, you know, what you take home in your paycheck and do we promote you or not promote you? I don't know. Uri, what do you think? I mean, <laughs> Do you think we develop these parts and like, there's nothing static about the part, right? I I don't think so. Um, People believe different things. Of course, the bottom line is you trust uh, the client's experience. For some parts might hang out in a certain state for a while. Um, I'm glad you're circling back to this just to tie the loose end around um, after you work with the exile, I made it seem like, oh, managers and firefighters just naturally change sometimes and they can. I think the minimum is that at that point, it becomes possible for them to change. But in IFS, they ha- they cue that and they'll ask those parts and even exiles, what were you really meant to do? And And some of what you two are getting at is just being in safe spaces, like the corporate world and really any job somebody has those aren't democratic spaces those are fascist structures <laughs> you lose your rights and that's not hyperbole you don't have rights in a company as an employee you're down power you're vulnerable and it's a capitalist system you don't have work and you're not productive you don't have other resources you're homeless um, and it's it's fairly sociopathic So that's not a safe environment. And when we're not in safe environments, that is when all these parts are much more likely to mobilize. And when we're in safe environments, that creates a degree of unblending by default. And that's why it's so important for therapists to do their own work and to hold a certain space and to be nonviolent and ethical and respect boundaries and be client-centered and cooperative. Um, but that's some of what you're speaking to is, uh, yeah, and in a perfect world, we would have evolved to a point where we care about the people who are most vulnerable. The Neil Donald Walsh wrote about how that's the main marker for an enlightened society is how do they care for the most vulnerable members? Mm-hmm. We're not there by any stretch of the imagination. And for a lot of people, the therapy space is the only space where they can, you know, truly be themselves and let down their guard and maybe 
release of armoring and be seen fully and see be seen on much deeper levels um, and that's sad it's a shame that that's where we are and therapists are acting essentially as like surrogate parents um which i think is a really important role um i just wish it wasn't as necessary as it is no i love learning about safe spaces personally because i i definitely think that's true when you're kind of in a you know definitely unsafe you know, or maybe just even a foreign environment or situation, definitely those parts are, you know, trying to protect you, you know, or try to, you know, it's just kind of a thing that they do. So it totally makes sense. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Kiki, that's a brilliant point. Uh, I had an undergrad professor who was a neurologist, and she talked about how we are more afraid on average of the unknown than we are of death or public speaking, like we do not like the unknown. And the unknown by default seems unsafe. It might be the safest place in the world, but you don't recognize it. It's not familiar. And so you're going to initially understandably be on guard. And they've, they've, at least a Dion, the creator of synergistic play therapy, who is actually a member of my cohort, absolutely brilliant therapist and created this amazing play therapy technique. She talks about how the amygdala gets triggered by four things. Unsafe environments, duh. Uh, the unknown is one. And then it's any kind of should, mm. any kind of judgment, essentially. Uh, and that's interesting. I had another supervisor, Dewey Freeman, and he would talk about how judgments are essentially predatory now. Like when and he, he learned this from horses, if you try to approach a horse, and you're kind of dysregulated, you will register as a threat and the horse will brace and you can see it in their bodies. And then if you if you approach a horse and you're judging the horse, similar effect. And so now we are, you know, very judgmental species. And that's, I think, a very human thing. Uh -huh. And then the last one, which is interesting, is incongruency. If people say one thing, but they actually feel something else, that comes across as incongruency. And that was a huge focus of Gestalt psychotherapy is helping people uncover who are you really and getting more congruent with that. Um, it's very, very interesting that the younger generations, I've never seen this, where they're so focused on authenticity mm -hmm. and it's safer. Even if someone's mad at you, it's safer if they're just being straightforward about it and they're being authentic. That's, that's not an accident. Yeah. It's, interesting. it's almost like a superpower that this you younger see, generation has. Do you see it that way, Key? Um, well, you um, or you brought up something really interesting too that I was going to ask your opinion on. Um, you know, society definitely makes a lot of like judgments, I think, about each other. I mean, we have our schemas and everything like that, and we just, you know, kind of just happens subconsciously. Sometimes we make a quick judgment about someone or something, and you know, when I started to read No Bad Parts and get into IFS, I was kind of in this place mentally where I was like, I don't believe people are naturally good. You know, I think in my generation, we have a lot of media exposure to all these shitty things happening in the world and seeing the, you know, the bad of a lot of, you know, human behavior and what's going on. And so, you know, kind of this, belief that people are, you know, good and just like, you know, born good in this world. I, I interestingly had a hard time believing that or kind of grappling with that because of, you know, you know, these judgments that I've made or my exposure. And I think it might be kind of a Gen Z thing with everything that we've seen, you know, go on in the world. Um, I'm wondering if you have any kind of thoughts about that, like, you know, maybe for someone or maybe someone in my generation who has seen a lot of, and I mean, all of us have seen, you know, maybe exiled parts come out or in people and we associate it with like a, you know, bad behavior or scary behavior um, and how we kind of maybe would change that mind frame. That's a great question, Kiki. So hi there. I'm sorry I had to edit the video ending with Kiki's question, it's kind of a cliffhanger. <laughs> and you might want to check out part two 
uh, part two is where Uri Talmor addresses Kiki's question. So check out part two, please. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Mm -hmm.